who volunteered for this event. Uh, we really appreciate everyone coming out here. And uh, for, for many of us, this day is important because it's Labor Day. For many of us, this day is important because we're Bernie Sanders supporters. Yeah. And uh, I want to say for my part that I, I started following the, this movement uh, probably about middle July. And uh, for me, this movement has been very important because I see it as an opportunity for genuine change in our nation. Uh, not merely as another candidate, but as the ability and the potential, the opportunity for regular people, for working people, to come together and to work for change in our, in our nation. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, Woo. welcome to Labor Day 2015 in Woodstock, Illinois. My name is Robert Rosenberg and I am a volunteer for Woodstock, Illinois for Bernie Sanders. I want to thank all of you for joining us on what we hope will be an enjoyable and memorable afternoon. Today is Labor Day. And once again, working people across the nation are joining together to reflect on our history, to share our stories, and to consider the future. It is said that the long memory is the most radical idea in America. And so today, we are going to do something most radical. As we stand upon ground that is rich with history, we are going to reach back long ago to the memory of how we came to call September 7th Labor Day. We are going to recall memories of courage, solidarity, and sacrifice. I celebrate Labor Day because it is, because it is an opportunity to reflect upon the past. It reminds me of what hardships working people have endured, and it reminds me of what victories working people can attain when they organize and struggle together. I, I celebrate Labor Day because it is an opportunity to share in the long memory of the labor movement, to understand the connection between thoughts places, and events, and to understand not only where we are going, but where we want to go and how we can get there. Thank you for joining me in this celebration. Yeah. I want to invite up onto the stage uh, one of my fellow volunteers, Steve Stukenberg. He's going to share a few words with us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing this day with us. And thank you for having an open mind to the ideas of your neighbors, your friends, and your community. Thank you to Bernie for Woods, Woodstock for Bernie. Um, part of this group, yes. Uh, we put this together. Uh, and when we were doing this part, when I was doing my part to put this together, I found out it was very frustrating. Uh, some people are frustrating. Not my group, but some people in general are frustrating. And how frustrating it is to activate people, to inspire people, to get people really to do anything. But then I realized that's all we have. All we have is each other to lean on. All we have is each other to fight alongside. All we have is a community to work with our local leaders, our state leaders, and our national leaders. That's all we have is each other. Because if we don't take care of each other, we don't watch out for each other, no one else really will. I'm a 20 year high school teacher. This is my union shirt right here. Uh, 20 year union member, yes. I reached out to my IEA union president to help with this program and to possibly speak at this wonderful event. 
I called him. I didn't text him. I didn't email him or Facebook him. I called him a month ago. And he sent me an email last Thursday. I was kind of mad. I didn't respond to his email. But I realized he is all I have. He's the only union president I have. And despite my disagreements with him, with the ideas, the action of the union, they're all I have to defend me in the workplace. They're all I have. The reason, though, why Woodstock, Illinois, is important to the holiday of Labor Day is because of one man, Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs is the most famous inmate to be jailed in this courthouse over here, the Woodstock Jail. It was chosen for Eugene Debs for two reasons. Number one, he was charged with contempt of court related to his activities in the 1894 Pullman strikes in Chicago, Illinois. The second reason they chose Woodstock is if they kept him in a Chicago jail, he would certainly inspire mass demonstrations mass protests, and maybe violence because he was so popular. He was so popular, they decided to send him all the way out to Woodstock to our lonely, lovely jail out here in 1895. When Devs was sent here, there were some farmers who threatened to lynch him. However, the majority of Woodstock residents loved Eugene Debs. One of the residents that loved him the most was the sheriff George Eckert. The sheriff did not consider Debs to be dangerous. As long as Debs did not betray the trust of the sheriff, he allowed him to have free run of the jail. This is all true, by the way. He even got him a secretary to handle all the fan mail that came for Eugene Debs at the courthouse. Woo! He allowed him to exercise before breakfast with his union friends and other jailmates every day. Debs led a four-hour study period after breakfast, before lunch, every day. Four-hour study period after lunch, before dinner. And then after dinner, a two-hour debate every day. The sheriff loved him so much, they became lifelong friends. He ate dinner with the sheriff and his family. He took him on hunting expeditions and fishing expeditions around the area. He allowed Debs to stroll the square that we all sit right now, and the inmates were known to play football behind the jail over there. It is true that Eugene Debs was joined, I'm sorry, was turned in onto socialism here at this jail. He was visited by socialist Victor Berger from Milwaukee, a British labor leader. The Chancellor of Germany visited Debs here at this jail. The Governor of Colorado and groundbreaking reporter Nellie Bly. Look her up. It is true that Debs became a socialist here at Woodstock Jail, but despite that, when Jeb Debs was released from prison on November 22nd, 1895, this square was packed with enthusiastic, enthusiastic people. The crowds greeted him and actually carried him on their shoulders around the square. And they had a train waiting for him, a uh, special training for him. Debs was a hero. I would like to read an excerpt from his most famous speech. The speech that sent him to jail in 1912 by unanimous decision by the Supreme Court. He was in jail for 10 years. In this speech, he speaks out against World War I. Although we are not involved in a world war per se, this speech still makes sense today since we are involved in many wars. There's a war in Afghanistan, there's a war in Iraq, there's a war in the streets of Chicago right now, there's a war on racism, there's a war on education, there's a war on cancer, there's a war on prison system, there's a war on poverty, we are all at war. So here's an excerpt from this famous speech. Now I'm going to become Eugene Debs, give me a second. Canton, Ohio, 1918, Debs' speech. Wars throughout history have been waged for the conquest and plunder. In the Middle Ages, when the feudal lords inhabited the castles whose 
towers we may still see today concluded to enlarge their domains. To increase their power, their prestige, their wealth, they declared war upon one another. But they themselves did not go to war. Any more than the modern feudal lords, the barons of Wall Street, go to war. The feudal barons of the Middle Ages, the economic predecessors of capitalists of our day, declared all the wars, and their miserable serfs fought all the battles. The poor, ignorant serfs have been taught to revere their masters, to believe that when their masters declared war upon one another, it was their patriotic duty to fall upon one another and to cut one another's throats for the profit and glory of the lords and the barons who held them in contempt. And that is war in a nutshell. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives. They've always taught and trained you to believe it is your patriotic duty to go to war, to have yourself slaughtered at their command. But in all the history of the world, you, the people, have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange is certainly and strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. And let me emphasize this fact, and it cannot re be repeated too often, that the working class who fight the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish the corpses, have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. It is the ruling class that invariably does both. They alone declare the war. They alone make the peace. If war is right, let it be, let it be decided by the people. You have your lives to lose. You certainly have, above all others, the right to decide the momentous issue of war or peace. The people should decide our fate. The people, us, need to get involved in our city government of Woodstock, and our state government of Illinois, and the national government. Unions are essential in making this for us and truly a democracy. Thank you. I didn't know if it was going to be morning or uh, afternoon, so I'll say good morning and afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Steve Stuckenberg and the other organizers uh, of today's event for inviting me here to say a few words on this day. We set aside each year in this country to honor working men and women. The people who labor to put food on our tables, build our cars and trucks that we drive, to serve and protect us on the streets of our cities and towns, to care for us in hospitals and nursing homes, and to teach our children as I did for 33 years here in Woodstock. I've, I've been a member of the American Federation of Teachers and the Illinois Federation of Teachers for 43 years. Even before that, I spent summers working alongside union brothers and sisters in the trucking industry, in the air freight industry, and in an iron foundry. I learned a lot from these hardworking men and women on the freight docks and the iron foundry and in the school buildings where I worked. Only once here in Woodstock did I have to walk a picket line for my own union. That was 41 years ago, the last time we had a teacher strike in District 200. As a young teacher and a union member, I saw our leaders fighting for our rights, 
I saw them arrested for doing what they believed was in the best interest of the members of their union. I've walked picket lines with newspaper workers, with hotel employees, and of course with teachers in many other unions. I've marched for workers' rights in Chicago, in Springfield, in Madison, Wisconsin, in Washington, D.C. I support the men and women throughout the labor movement who make up the group we call the middle class and ever-shrinking classification. I believe in the idea of a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, no matter what that work involves. The AFT, American Federation of Teachers, was founded 100 years ago to provide a voice for teachers as workers. It has expanded to include custodians, secretaries and aides, food service workers, health care professionals, and school social workers, counselors, and psychologists. In Woodstock, I was proud to lead more than a thousand of these folks as president of the McHenry County Federation of Teachers, Local 1642, for many years. I continue in retirement to serve them on the executive board of the Illinois Federation of Teachers and now as a member, a board member of the Illinois Alliance for Retired Americans. Some unions were formed as a result of sweatshops and in the manufacturing industry, while others like ours to give a collective voice to our members through collective bargaining and agree to a fair contract to protect our members' rights. We've stood side by side with other groups, fighting for social justice, fighting against discrimination of any kind, advocating for our students, defending voters' rights, fighting for equal pay for women, and defending the rights of those with disabilities. Today, the AFT is 1.6 million members strong, represents teachers and support staff, college and university educators and support staff, state workers, nurses and health professionals, and retirees like me. We continue to support quality public education, health care, and services for our students, their families, and our communities. Unions throughout the country continue to support the needs to expand Social Security and Medicare, to provide for older Americans and the disabled. It's criminal that men and women in their 70s and 80s have to go back to work at minimum wage in order to live. I think, I think it's criminal older Americans to have to choose between buying medicines and buying food. And that is the choice that some of our seniors have to make. Senator Bernie, Bernie Sanders has pointed out that our economy today is much stronger than when President George W. Bush left office seven years ago. However, the middle class is continuing its 40-year decline. The Senator also points out that almost all new income and wealth is going to the people on the top, while millions of Americans work longer hours for lower wages. Wages in recent years have fallen for 90% of Americans as they have risen for the top 10%. While the percentage of union members nationwide has fallen to less than 12%, and even less than that in the private sector, the need to fight for labor rights and fair wages and contracts is still with us. In the America of the 21st century, we often have to take the battle for our rights from work sites and union halls to the political arenas, state capitals, and Washington, D.C. Today we are faced with politicians who backed by their own obscene wealth or the wealth of others like the Koch brothers and the Waltons are out to destroy the middle class. We have people running for national office like Chris Christie who believes that national 
that, that uh, national teachers unions deserve a punch in the face for only thinking about higher wages and not the needs of students. Absolutely not true. Another governor, I won't even mention his name, but lives about 100 miles from here, <laughs> recently compared union members in his state to members of the terrorist organization ISIS. Our own governor in Illinois has put a bullseye on unions and is working hard to make them extinct. His efforts to create right-to-work zones is designed to cut wages and union membership and that will hurt people and do nothing for the economy of Illinois. The news is not all bad. There are some glimmers of hope. A recent Gallup poll showed that Americans' approval of labor unions is the highest it's been since 2008. Other studies are showing that efforts such as raising the minimum wage do not result in loss of jobs, but rather help people and businesses in the long run. Labor Day is a national holiday and it is good that we call attention to the working men and women in this country. But one day of the year is not enough. Every day must be Labor Day in this country. We must all remember the people who have labored before us to get us here and work in their names and in the names of our children and our grandchildren to fight for the rights of workers, to elect legislators and politicians who will translate that fight into laws to protect and support labor. We all need to do our part to help our brothers and sisters in the labor movement today, tomorrow, and always. Have a wonderful Labor Day. Wagner did not write the bill creating the National Labor Relations Act. A bipartisan group of staffers filled in the details. Because they amended previous acts, the sections of such acts are all in the same order. In labor law, section 9 is for protests. Sneaked into the bill, buried in the detail in section 9, are several important points noted in my copy here of the National Labor Relations Act, in case anybody wants to check it, Read them together, and they explain the 23% certification success rate in union organizational drives. Labor management companies advertise, sign with us. You will never have a union on your property. You can look them up online. They're all small companies, 20, 30, 40 employees located in some obscure town, usually in the Midwest. What do they know? They know how to protest the certification of the petition in federal superior court as specified in section nine. The petition was filed with the National Labor Relations Board during an organizational drive with at least 50% plus one of eligible signatures requesting certification of that union representing a specific group of workers. The act directs the court to disclose the petition to the company as discovery. The company then demands, is there a right under the act, an election, even though a majority have already signed the petition supporting their union. For the next year or two, the company uses delaying tactics while they get rid of the union supporters. How fair is that? In spite of high unemployment and management excuses, union certification rose dramatically until the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, or the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, which was passed over Democratic President Truman's veto. Some worker protections were enhanced, such as a prohibition against blackballing or blacklisting an employee. In 1906, my grandfather was vice president of the Railway Maintenance Union on the Elgin Joliet Line. He was blacklisted when they struck and lost and could never work for a railway anywhere in America again. Most of the provisions of Taft-Hartley are designed to curtail union power. No surprise to learn then that the primary author, previous employment was general counsel for the National Association of Manufacturers, 
The bill's sponsor, conservative Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, was the front runner for the 1952 Republican presidential uh, nomination. The unpopularity of Taft's bill not only killed his presidential chances, but it probably saved the 1948 election for Truman and got the moderate Republican President Eisenhower elected in 1952 as he campaigned to rein in the worst abuses of Taft-Hartley. Conservatives are still at it today. Presidential candidate Jeb Bush was recently quoted in the New Yorker as saying that one of the reasons he supported charter schools was to reduce the power of teachers' unions. He even said why. Union members and unions tend to endorse Democratic candidates. Today we see many former union-friendly states vote to invoke Taft-Hartley anti-union restrictions against agency shop, maintenance of membership, union shop within the borders of their state. Closed shop, remember, was already prohibited nationwide. Why should you belong to a union is heard at a political campaign. Our new governor has recently been quoted as claiming that a worker should not have to pay union dues to be donated for a political campaign he may not support. None of this is true. Union dues may not be used for political donations. They may be used for a nonpartisan voter registration drive, and they may be used for private communication, including an endorsement, but not a donation, of a candidate. A union PAC supported by additional funds donated by union members is the only way that a union can su financially support a candidate. And you must recertify as an individual member of that union every year in writing that you wish to contribute to that PAC. I know because I had to do that every year. Agency shop. That means that a non-member must pay a fee for services rendered. After a merger where the previous Master Executive Council of my union did not protect our acquired pilots, many of them expected our council to fix the things that went wrong with their council, and it would have been illegal for our council to spend a dime to fix their previous problems. We had been in open shop where voluntary membership was 99% effective. When hundreds of these acquired pilots left the union, we voted to become an agency shop. The Attorney General of Georgia, the home of my company, which is a right to work state, took my union to court. He was summarily told by the federal judge to go read his labor law. Pilots work under the Railway Labor Act of 1926, not modified by Taft-Hartley, and we were legal to be an agency shop. Maintenance of membership means that a union member must not quit the union for the duration of a contract, even if they otherwise have the right to do so. Unions prefer this provision to prevent companies from using it as an anti-union tactic during bad times with pay cuts and benefit cuts. The union shop label seems to imply that a worker must be a member of the union. Remembering who wrote the Taft-Hartley Act, the author wanted to be able to make the misleading claim as he campaigned against forced union membership and in favor of right to work. The truth, union shop means that you must sample union membership. By the 31st day of employment, you must join the union and pay dues for 90 days. If you read the original law, it said for two years. It was subsequently modified to 90 days or expiration of current contract. You may then resign membership and never pay dues for the rest of your career. Meanwhile, the union is required, forced, to provide all the services to, that they provide to dues-paying members, including defense of a firing. Right now, the average firing offense costs the union $45,000 to defend. All newly negotiated benefits earned with union dues must be given to the freeloader. How fair is that? Other restrictions in Taft-Hartley include Union dues cannot be used for politics, but corporate funds may, and without permission of the stockholders who actually own the money. How fair is that? No hot cargo agreements are allowed by union or company. Hot cargo would prohibit handling of processing of goods made by scab labor, that means by a strike breaker. 
This is designed to prevent a general strike, which had been a very powerful tool to force companies to settle a dispute, or even to force a local government, like a city or county government, to intercede in ending a strike. Usually, something the companies did not want, because in mediation, the workers at least got part of what they were looking for. No secondary boycotts by unions. That means picketing or calling for a boycott of a company that uses a struck product. If your union, for example, is on strike at Stately Syrup and they sell to Coca-Cola, your union may not call for a boycott of Coca-Cola products. Strangely, there is no prohibition against companies doing exactly the same thing. Walmart does this all the time. They pressure a supplier to offer them the lowest wholesale price exclusively on their products or lose the account. I believe this should be prohibited by unions and by companies. Another union term, dues checkoff, is under fire in states with conservative governors such as Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Taft-Hartley does allow the direct deduction of dues or voluntary benefit plan payments so long as a company holds a written permission from the employee. This cannot be re irrevocable for more than a year. Since courts have long agreed that federal labor law supersedes state law, Governor Walker was wrong to think that he could stop dues checkoff even for his state employees. Collection of dues, and he didn't, by the way. Uh, collection of dues is a very time-consuming process and expensive for unions, but even revenue positive for the employer because the money he does not pay directly to the employee is paid monthly or even quarterly, as was the case with my union, way in arrears into the coffers of the union. Another anti-union tactic is to claim that the increased cost of union workers will make the company non-competitive. Might look correct at first, but really it is not. Union labor in product measurable work is 23% more effect effective and more efficient than non-union work. That might seem like a lot, but check these statistics. Union workers train their own through apprenticeship programs. Union workers have a much better career retention rate. Union workers provide their own first level supervision through leads who are experienced journeymen or master workers and they were paid a very modest premium. Union workers have a better attendance record. They identify with their union and usually with a company as well and they don't want to let down their buddies. The young guy on the shift with a two year old cut into his sleep last night knows that the lead will take it easy on him today so he shows up. OJI rates for union workers are less than one third of the injury rate for non-union workers. Union safety programs enhance this statistic. On top of this, union pay averages 15% more than non-union pay. The company rightly shares in the increased efficiency and profits from it. So if all this is true, why are companies so against unionization? Unionized companies, according to the Economic Policy Institute, pay their CEOs less than non-union companies. Corporate leadership might not get that fat bonus. The real issue, however, is not labor costs. It's workplace control. Most aggressive business leaders have no allegiance to their companies. Their careers are portable. They are taught by MBA schools to make a profit peak in the short run and collect all of their profit sharing and sell the stock while it's high and leave, go somewhere else. Unions have a vested interest in the long-term survival of the company and resist such tactics. If stockholders knew the truth, they would agree with the unions. But not all companies are so against unions and some actually have invited unions onto the property. Almost 20% of successful union drives are supported by companies such as AT&T, Comcast, VW, Costco. Illinois is not a right to work state. It is an at will work state. All states are at will work states. That means you may quit or be fired with no notice and no reason, unless you have a labor contract that stipulates otherwise. So unless you are working under a union contract, or in rare cases, a private labor contract, you really have no job protection anywhere. Taft-Hartley was designed to make it more difficult to form a union or maintain a union on that property. The most recent exercise of the Labor Management Act of 1947 
was Governor Walker in Wisconsin. Another promise he made to convince the electorate to support him was job creation. And that's another lie. Right to work states have no better job creation rate than any other state. And in the case of Wisconsin, they're last in the Midwest. The American Federation of Labor publishes a lot of U.S. Labor Department statistics. They're easy to find on the website. Right to work states have a 12% lower wage than non right to work states. 26% of their jobs are created at below poverty level. Not that other states do so much better with 18% below the poverty level. Better, but nothing to brag about. So right to work really does mean right to work for less. Labor unions tend to raise all wages in states where they are allowed to flourish. Right to work states have higher poverty levels, higher infant mortality rates, over an already high national rate. The shameful statistic is the 31% higher rate of citizens without health care insurance in right to work states. And this last statistic you'll never see in the mass media. Right to work states have a higher OJI rate and a 54% higher workplace death rate. What more do you need to know to resist Taft Hartley? So I've made the moral case for unions and their higher wages. The economic case is this higher wages are good for the economy, which is over three quarters driven by consumer spending. Real working class wealth is 20% less than 40 years ago. Real wages are 40% less, so this wealth decline is accelerating. Good economic times used to be accompanied by real wage growth. The best decade of economic growth since the panic of 1893 was the 1950s when unionization was at its highest and real wages increased rapidly and in accordance with workplace efficiency increases. Unionization is historically following the rise of the middle class. This period of the 50s was also the highest tax rate for the rich and for corporations, both of which still showed record wealth gains. Conservatives rail against government interference in commerce, claiming it reduces efficiency and ties their hands. Higher taxes will kill jobs, they complain. Low taxes, they believe, will cause a little wind effect here. The job creators to invest in new businesses, creating new jobs. If low taxes, and in the U.S., real taxes paid by corporations and the rich are lower than any other developed nation. Forget that 35% corporate taxes highest in the world that John McCain would say again and again and again with a sly grin. Real taxes. Taxes actually pay lowest of any developed nation, corporations and the rich. So, if this were true, we would be awash in jobs, and we are not, especially in jobs that are well-paying. And this will not improve under right to work. It will not improve with today's $50 trillion of profits unreinvested in our economy. Wealth held in raw land or government bonds or invested abroad where it does not create jobs. This is where tax cuts really go. Bush provided in 19, or sorry, in 2005, a tax cut for one year for large corporations who held untaxed profits abroad to bring them, and it totaled $31 billion, back into America and not pay taxes. He argued that this would create jobs. The 30 rich companies who benefited by this the most created in the following year a net of zero jobs. They laid off more people than they hired. Since Reagan, whose aim was to break unions, we have all lived with lower wages, longer hours, trade agreements to cost American lives, a Wall Street stealing the wealth that workers create, and lowered expectations for our children. 10% of American children are below the poverty level. 10% of our children go to school hungry, and that is the number one reason for failing American public education results. The poverty rate from American seniors is above 10% and rising, while retirement checks disappear and IRAs earn 1%. How fair is this? Almost 2 million 
more people voted Democratic than Republican in the last election, and we still have a strong Republican majority in Congress. How fair is this? And what are you going to do about it? Move to Canada? Or get to work in politics to fix the situation? Thank you. So our, our next speaker, uh, some of you may know already, uh, his name is Patrick Murfin. He's a, he is a lifelong labor and social justice activist. As a young man, he was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, the historic militant labor union known as the Wobblies. He served them in many capacities, including as an organizer, a speaker, editor of the Industrial Worker, and General Secretary Treasury. He has lived in McHenry County for more than 30 years, where he has been a fixture and sometimes the face of numerous social justice causes. He was a co-founder of the Diversity Day Festival here on the square and hosted the event for 11 out of the 13 years it was held. Patrick was also active in the Democratic Party of McHenry County, retiring last year after nearly 30 years as a pre precinct representative and a former party secretary and chair. Since 2005, he has maintained the labor blog, Heretic, Rebel, A Thing to Flout, where he continues to write about labor history, social justice, and the Woodstock and McHenry County community. Let's have a big round of applause for Patrick Murphin. here on, on this, uh, in this gazebo. I spent a lot of time here over the years. It feels kind of comfortable. I haven't been, a, been a behind a microphone here for two or three years, and I'm glad to be here and I uh, hope I don't bore you too much. Some of what I'm about to say you have heard earlier, but the, you know what, what speakers say, tell them once, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you just told them, and then summarize it. I want you all to take a look over here. The red brick building with the with the brand new copper dome is the old is the old McHenry County Courthouse. Next to it, a little lighter colored, is the jail. That is the jail where Eugene V. Debs was held after the Pullman strike, along with his entire executive board. It was put there after the strike was crushed to keep the workers of Chicago from storming the Cook County Jail and liberating him. You heard the story earlier, if you were here long ago, how, of, of how he spent his time here. And he spent his time in study. Victor Berger brought down, uh, came down and brought a bunch of books. He and his, he and his fellow workers uh, spent the, his months here studying. He came in a, tra a, a, a simple trade unionist and he left a, a socialist and a committed revolutionary unionist. And in doing so, he changed the face of American history. My favorite story about Debs and Woodstock, however, is the story of his release, which you also heard a little bit, but I want you to picture it. It's a cool day in November. The leaves are off the trees, and the trees were much smaller. I've seen pictures. He and his executive board were released by the jail, given a good, hearty handshake by his good friend George Eckert, the sheriff. And this square was filled with more than 5,000 people. That was more people than lived in Woodstock. But it included many Woodstock people because Woodstock was an industrial city. Oliver Typewriter was getting off the ground and a dozen other important industries were located in Woodstock. Workers came from all across northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin to be here. And when he emerged from that jail door, the workers of Woodstock and the workers of Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin hoisted him 
to their, into their shoulders. They came through this square, they marched around it, and they walked down Main Street to the train station where the Deb Special was waiting to take Eugene B. Debs to Chicago, where five times that many workers were ready to greet him. Now that is the heritage that we have here at Woodstock. And I also want to you to imagine all of the very comfortable uh, Republican establishment of Woodstock in those days. And it was a Republican establishment even back then. I want you to imagine what they must have felt when they saw 5,000 workers in their own town with Eugene V. Debs on their shoulders. And then, if you're a Woodstockian or a McHenry County person, be mighty proud. really important is the, the linkage between Debs and the Pullman strike and Labor Day. Every other country in the world virtually celebrates May, Labor Day on May 1st. Why? Because it commemorates the so-called martyrs of Chicago, the Haymarket martyrs who were hung in 1886, supposedly for throwing a bomb during a, 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 a labor rally at the Haymarket during a citywide general strike for the eight-hour day. Samuel Gompers, of all people, went to an international congress and made the motion to make Labor Day, May Day, Labor Day. And it's celebrated all over the world. And in Mexico, it is known as La Dia de los Muertos de Chicago. May, May, May Day represented militant unionism. And during these years, from the, about the time of the Great Railway Strike in 1877 that swept this nation like wildfire, all the way to the end of the Depression and the dawn of World War II, there was a class war in this country. And I don't mean that idly. I mean a shooting class war with dead bodies, jailed people, disappeared people, martyrs by the thousands. It was a, it was a war waged by the bosses and by, the, by their cronies in the state and federal and local governments. And it most often, like it did in the Pullman strike, crushed the aspirations of the workers. The story of labor history in this country is the story of unimaginable sacrifice against overwhelming odds and the refusal to keep laying down after having been beaten there time after time after time after time again. In 1895, when the Pullman strike started, and you'll be hearing a lot more detail about that, Grover Cleveland, the Democratic president, against the advice of a Democratic governor, in Illinois, John Peter Otgeld, a, his, a, a true hero who you should learn about, called in federal troops to crush the Pullman strike. In Chicago, they, they, they were all over the country, but they concentrated in Chicago where the Pullman factories were and where the greatest railway yards in the country were. Ca cavalry with drawn sabers rode down workers. At least 30, maybe more, were killed and the strike was crushed, as so many other strikes had been crushed. Debs as an entire executive board were arrested and charged with conspiracy to disrupt the mails because the railroads attached a Pullman car to every mail train in the country. 
Grover Cleveland had crushed that strike. But politically, he needed the support of northern workers. So he supported and got the support of Republicans, particularly Mark Hanna and the Civic Federation, to pass through Congress and sign into law Labor Day as we know it today. Labor Day had an origin as a local labor festival in New York City, but it was not celebrated nationally. But six days, six days after the Pullman strike was crushed, Grover Cleveland signed the bill that established Labor Day as a federal holiday. So we owe this occasion to a sop thrown to us, a bone thrown to us, a bribe thrown to us. But we'll take it. We'll seize it gladly and re-establish it as a celebration of workers, the labor movement, on an equal with the May Day that we'll also celebrate. Yeah. Now the most important thing to realize is that the struggle that went on all those years when all those bodies were stacking up and all those men and women were being imprisoned and all those families evicted and starving and all the miles that Mother Jones and the child laborers marched. Those issues and those things are living today. Why? Because in the last 50 years, a counter movement has arisen to destroy the labor movement. And it's been successful to a large degree, and largely because tons of money funneled into by people like the, like the Koch's, and it's, that started way back in the 50s when the Koch's daddy founded the, ground, the, the John Birch Society, to spending money to convince American workers, among other things, that they don't need unions. That unions were taking money out of their pockets and restricting their liberties. They succeeded by panicking workers about, about jobs, by sending them overseas and then turning around and blaming the unionized workers as if they, those jobs were not going to go overseas anyway. They did it by buying the Republican Party, lock, stock, and barrel and establishing a right-wing junta that has taken over many state governments. Right. right. Today, the labor movement is finally beginning to stir again. It is waking up from its own synobulence. It was punch drunk. And frankly, some of the labor movement was fat and lazy and out of touch with its own membership. The labor movement of today is realizing it could not be that anymore. The labor movement of today is realizing that it must be responsive to the needs of workers, including the millions and millions of unorganized workers that are now outside of it. And the working people of this country are doing what they have always done which is reinventing their organizations from the ground up. And where there are not unions in place in the traditional sense, they are forming new kinds of organizations to meet the needs of the emergency. And we've seen that repeatedly. We saw that, we saw that in Wisconsin. Yes, Labor unions were there and led a lot, but most of those people surrounding the state house all those months through that bitter winter of Scott Walker's first term were not, were not card carrying union members. But a movement, a popular movement of working people arose 
that refuse to be beaten down. We, we've seen it in the Occupy movement, which was just a few short years ago, swept this country and put it in something of a panic, so much of a panic that it suddenly got hushed up as if it had never happened. That was working people reinventing their own voice, asserting their own authority over their own lives. We even see it today at every opportunity, as, as the bosses, as they have always done, take every opportunity to divide us by language, race, religion, sex, and any other way they can chop and dice us apart. That is, that is why the rise of the immigrant rights organizations led by immigrant workers, documented and undocumented, and the support that they've gotten from American workers of other skin colors and cultures who, have wa who are waking up to the fact that they are be have been used is so important. That is even why as controversial as it may be to some people, the Black Lives Matter movement counts. Why the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina that has resurrected the historic civil rights movement and married it, married it to the labor movement is so important. And that's why, frankly, we need also a political expression, and there is no one in this country who is begging a voice for that political expression better than the man who so admired Eugene V. Debs that he once made a wonderful documentary about him. The man who, who inherits the heritage of Eugene V. Debs and the platform of 19, uh, the platform of 1916, with the Socialist Party, which called for Social Security and into child labor an eight-hour day, on and on and on. The platform that was eventually adopted and enforced by the New Deal. There's only one candidate who is forging a movement to bring that expression to politics. And you know what? To every, the, they, they cannot believe it. The media's jaws are still on the floor. They cannot believe that in red states like, like Alabama and Mississippi, thousands of people turn out. They cannot believe that this message is, is resonating from a goddamn self-proclaimed socialist named Bernie Sanders. Yeah! We've got a tremendous amount of work to do. We've got work in our own job locations. We have to rebuild the labor movement. We have work in the streets. We have the work of defense, and we have the work of offense. And we have the work of electoral politics. And I'm calling you to answer that call. Answer it with more urgency than you had when you came here. I'm asking you to reach out to each and every one of your friends and neighbors and enlist them in all the aspects of this cause. Because it's not just one thing. It's got to be all of them. Are you with me? Yeah! yeah. Solidarity forever! Okay, we have uh, our next speaker this afternoon. His name is Mark Burroughs. Mark Burroughs has worked in the railroad industry for over 40 years. Some wind here. Uh, most of that time as a locomotive engineer. For years, he has, he has advocated for the rail unions to unite in a counteroffensive against the carrier's attack on safety, working conditions, 
dignity as well as quality of life on and off the job. As the delegate representing his local 1433 of the Transportation Division of the Sheet Metal, Air, Rail and Transportation Union at the last two international conventions, he has taken that fight to the national level, getting a favorable response to his vision and his ideals. Mark is on the steering committee of Railroad Workers United, which is a cross-craft <laughs> cross caucus of rail labor activists across North America. Quoting from their quarterly newspaper, The Highball, RWU grew out of decades of struggle within the craft unions for unity, solidarity, and democracy. We are carrying on a tradition of rank and file activity which dates back to the 1890s and the time of Eugene V. Debs. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Burroughs. Thank you. Uh, give me one second here to get situated here. And while I'm doing that, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, oh, I need that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely need it. The, uh, want to thank the speakers. Uh, Evelyn, if you're out there, I spoke with you about this first. And, uh, again, all the other, the organizers, the speakers, the musicians, uh, the wonderful, uh, 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 hey there. All right. Uh, great labor uh, fighting songs reconnecting us with our history and I want to thank all of you for uh, coming out here to make this happen I gotta say when I when I landed here I think I was in Woodstock once when I was a kid I, there may, may have been a concert at the Opera House or the theater or something like that but uh, I have to say I, you know I didn't get the significance as I do now and I have to say I was very choked up to come face to face with this uh, courthouse and its historical significance. Uh, Eugene Debs has long been uh, w one of my heroes. Um, as, as Patrick, who I might add is going to be a very tough act to follow, I'll give it my best shot, uh, 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 mentioned this documentary that Bernie Sanders did on Eugene Debs in 1979 before uh, he ran for, for uh, mayor of Burlington, Vermont. And if you haven't seen it, by all means, uh, it, it's fascinating. Uh, just Google, do some search on uh, Bernie Sanders' documentary on Debs, and uh, it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I want to start by quoting uh, Bernie Sanders' introduction. Debs was one of the most important Americans of the 20th century. Why? Why haven't they taught you about Eugene Debs and the ideas he fought for? The answer is simple. More than a half century after his death, the handful of people who own and control this country, including the mass media and the educational system, still regard Debs and his ideas as dangerous, as a threat to their stability and class rule, as someone best forgotten about. On the AFL-CIO website, under labor history biographies, there's a brief, bear with me with the wind here. There's a brief history of, of Eugene Debs with their own slant to it. And though I may personally have a minor beef or two with how the AFL-CIO presents Debs, uh, it's noteworthy that they even acknowledge him at all considering that Debs did not exactly sing the praises of the traditional union leaders of his day. Um, I want to quote the introductory paragraph from this uh, AFL-CIO history on Debs. Beloved by many contemporaries as a man, quote, too good for this world, who would give the clothes off his back to anyone in need, Gene Debs was a prominent leader of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen in his youth. Later he helped found the American Railway Union in 1894, the Socialist Party of America in 1901, and the Industrial Workers of the World in 1905. The best known apostle of industrial unionism in the early years of the 20th century, Debs ran for president of the United States on the Socialist Party ticket five times between 1900 and 1920, winning millions of votes. 
And although none of his dreams were realized during his lifetime, Debs inspired millions to believe in, quote, the emancipation of the working class and the brotherhood of all mankind, unquote. And he helped spur the rise of industrial unionism and the adoption of progressive social and economic reforms. Uh, Patrick helped flesh that out a little bit earlier. So here we have to, here we have a young idealistic Bernie Sanders who is now a serious contender for the Democratic Party nomination yeah. and the AFL-CIO both stating clearly for the record that the vision and the ideals that Eugene Debs stood for are an important part of our history and here, here, I'll drink to that. Now I'll pose this question. By shining the light of day on this neglected history, is this merely an academic exercise for intellectual enlightenment, or are there lessons for us to learn from, to analyze, to process, and absorb in real time today, September 7th, and, and act upon as we commemorate Labor Day 2015? If you accept this premise that I submit, then by logical extension, those six months that Deb spent right across the street here in the Woodstock County Jail following the Pullman strike are an important part of this history. And I want to go into uh, I want to go into that a bit more in depth. First, I want to get back to a little bit of that time of, of who Debs was prior to uh, entering the Woodstock Jail. Prior to the Pullman strike, Debs had, had clearly made a name for himself as a union organizer, agitator, and leader. And as a railroad worker today, I I total I, I experience the degrading consequences of the carriers virtually having their way with us. And a major contributing factor to this being that we are still divided into some 13 plus different craft unions. Debs came to the conclusion over 120 years ago that this was a recipe for disaster and defeat. And that's why he founded the American Railway Union. He was incredulous with the same old tired scenario, such as once one of the craft unions settled for a bogus contract, then all the others were expected to settle for the same. And if one craft such as the firemen went on strike, then the engineers would scab, cross the picket lines, and do their work because they had a contract that they had a sacred duty to honor. The American Railway Union, along with the, coal, the, 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 the beginning of the coal miners union back in that period, were the first attempts at industrial unionism to organize all of the workers in an industry into one big union, irregardless of the various jobs, tasks, and crafts. And while the American U Railway Union was obliterated by the federal militia in the crushing defeat of the Pullman strike, his vision of industrial unionism would be realized on a grand scale a few decades later in the titanic class battles that, that broke out in the 30s, giving birth to major industrial unions such as the United Auto Workers and the United Steel Workers to, Union, to name a few. And though we in the rail industry have yet to pick up the pieces of the American Railway Union's defeat to fulfill our historic mission to organize ourselves into one industrial union, or to even at least act and function as one united structure. For us, for, for rail workers, my co-workers and, 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 and others coming into the industry, what Debs did accomplish stands today as a historical prototype for not only what is possible, but for what we need to do and what we need to find our way back to emulate and complete that mission. So Debs had already made an important contribution to the struggle of the working class with his vision of industrial unionism leading up to the Pullman strike. But with that said, I submit that the analysis and the conclusions that Debs arrived at during his six-month sabbatical at the Woodstock County Jail transcend even what he had already accomplished and contributed up to that point in time. Steve described his virtual metamorphosis uh, and, and those I... And I submit those ideals and vision are profoundly relevant and important to us today in our respective and collective struggles against the all too many manifestations of injustice in society and in the world today. They've been covered by, uh, by, by some of the speakers already, but like Pat said, say it again, say it again, say it again. All right. <laughs> We're talking about the direct vicious attack on workers directly on the job as well as in the various state legislatures in this country barbaric conditions for workers in sweatshops around the so-called third world. With millions here looking for jobs, competing against each other, the wages are driven to starvation level for those lucky enough to have one or two or three jobs to make ends meet. 
There's injustices in our streets, in our prisons, on our borders, as the human tragedy plays out today from the Middle East to Europe, as thousands desperately flee the barbarism of war imposed upon them, hundreds drowning at sea, as residential communities are arbitrarily turned into battlefields, or more accurately, I consider, I, I call it slaughter fields. Rampant injustice all over the world, in so many forms and manifestations, as the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil our food grows, grows, <laughs> grows in, is increasingly poisoned, as global warming and climate change have now gone mainstream. But instead of getting depressed and wallowing despair, the older I get, the more I take pride in being an angry young man. To the contrary, fighters, fighters like Debs have inspired me with the confidence that the world does not have to be like this, that we can fight for a more just, humane world, and more importantly, that we can ultimately triumph. Debs entered the Woodstock County Jail as an important ag agitator, labor organizer, and leader, and when he came out six months later, he was a revolutionary socialist. Now, you know, when I was preparing this, I, I, was, a little bit con uh, I was a little bit concerned, uh, how, you know, being controversial with the S word. Myself, I try to avoid terminology that can be confusing, especially when it can have different meanings, content and context to, to different people. I mean, to the, to the far right lunatic fringe of the Republican Party, Debs or someone like myself or others here who aspire to emulate him, are, you know, were easily perceived as the co second coming of Satan. For the last six to seven years plus, it has not been uncommon to have Obama and the S word in the same sentence. And uh, with all due respect, uh, uh, socialist Obama and, and socialist Debs, um, you know, two separate entities. But the winner, the winner of this game, uh, who can take the most extreme liberties with terminology, who can play the loose, the loose and fast with the facts, goes to Steve Chapman, a prominent member of the Chicago Tribune editorial board. Back on Thursday, October 20th, in a full-page commentary in the perspective section, I had, hold on, I, got to, I had to clamp it to my, my visual aids because of the wind. I don't, know if, I don't know how many of you saw this. This is just Thursday, August 20th. Um, full page in the editorial section. We have Bernie Sanders on the left with the picture of Karl Marx on the right and the headline, are Democrats really, and then of, of course in bold uh, uh, red print, are Democrats really socialist? And then the sub-headline, what Bernie Sanders surge reveals about the party. So I just throw that in there for comic relief. So before, so I, before I begin to quote Debs, I want to offer a couple of qualifications. Uh, um, th this isn't some hero worship, you know, I think I missed, yeah, I missed the page here. I lost the page. Uh, sorry about that. The best way to do justice and, 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 and to clarify any confusion about terminology and what Deb stood for is to just let Deb speak for himself. And, and, and that's what I intend to do, I'm the, the page that had that there. Uh, so before I begin to quote Debs, I want to offer a, a couple of qualifications. This isn't some hero worship, uh, uh, Deb said this and Deb said that. Uh, he says it best in a, he says it best in a little uh, blurb that uh, speaking at uh, the industrial work, IWW convention in 1905, If you are a working man, suppose you look yourself over just once. Take an invoice of your mental stock and see what you have. Do not accept my word. Do not depend on anybody but yourself. Think it out for yourself. And if you do, I am quite certain that you will join the organization that represents your class, the organization that has room for all your class, the organization that appeals to you to develop your own brain, to rely upon yourself and be a man among men. And that is what the working class have to do. Cultivate self-reliance and think and act for themselves. And that is what they are simulated to do in the industrial workers. So this is not about some cult hero guru worshiping. Uh, uh, it, Debs himself said, don't take my word. Uh, just 
does this make sense? And, and now I would add, does this uh, stand, does do his analysis and, and vis conclusions, vision ideals, stand the test of time? In 1912, Debs got close to a million votes for president. In 1916, Debs was not up for running for president, but the Socialist Party nominated him to run for Congress. The following are excer excerpts from his letter of acceptance uh, to that nomination. The Debs book that I like to use and make notes in is falling apart, but... Uh, the Socialist Party recognizes the fact that there is nothing in common between the exploiting and exploited classes, that there is in truth a conflict between them, old as the centuries, and that this conflict must continue with ever-increasing education and organization on the part of the working class until they have developed the power, economic, political, and otherwise, to abolish the prevailing system and establish the worldwide industrial democracy and commonwealth of comrades. The Socialist Party voices with unrelaxing devotion to its ideals and unconquerable faith in its mission, the interests, hope, hopes, and aspirations of the toiling and producing millions and their sympathizers. It is their party, sprung from their loins and consecrated to their cause, and it, and it stands uncompromisingly for their education, their organization, and their emancipation. It appeals to all workers to unite industrially and politically, to recognize their common kinship and make common cause in the great struggle to overthrow the system that robs and degrades them and win the world for democracy and peace, for freedom and self-government. It knows no race or nationality, no creed, no color, no sex. It stands loyally, unflinchingly for equal rights, equal freedom and equal opportunity for all. The mission of the Socialist Party is to destroy industrial despotism and establish industrial democracy, to abolish class rule and inaugurate true freedom, true freedom and self-government, wipe out rent, interest and profit, and produce wealth for the use of us all instead of for the benefit of the few. Stop producing parasites and paupers. Grant to women all the rights that men have. Liberate the children from the slave pens in which they are dwarfed, diseased and deformed. Proclaim the emancipation of the toiling masses and make the world fit for human beings to live in. All other parties stand for the present system, for wage slavery, poverty, unemployment, and the whole brood of social ills. The terrible war now raging in Europe, which has transformed nation after nation, boasting of their civilization and Christianity into hideous slaughterhouses, where millions of our brothers have turned brutes and been shot like dogs, where king and kaiser and czar rule, and bureaucracy and aristocracy and plutocracy, all rotten to the core and buttressed by dead men's bones, are supreme where honest toilers are fit only to slave in peace and die in war for the profit and glory of the parasites who hold the title deeds to their so-called fatherland, where the lamentations of widows are born on every breeze, where orphaned children by thousands are dying like insects, where there is wreck and ruin, desolation, agony, curses, misery, horrors untold and untellable, all crying to heaven in the name of God who has been denied and blasphemed in the name of humanity that has been betrayed and slaughtered, insulted, sold, spat upon, and crushed beneath the iron hoof of triumphant, mili triumphant militarism. These appalling, indescribable atrocities made ghastlier by the shriek and glare of the midnight bomb typify our vaunted civilization and place international capitalism, supported by every political party save the Socialist Party alone, on exhibition before the world, a lurid scene of crime and horror to be chronicled by history and handed down to remotest generations. And this is the true meaning of preparedness, for which the ruling class, its press, its pulpit, its college professors, and its menial hirelings and mercenaries in general are now clamoring in the United States. Preparedness is one of the cardinal principles of the Socialist Party, but it is diametrically opposed to the preparedness, as, preparedness advocated by the organs of predatory, plundering capitalism. The preparedness that the Socialist Party stands for is for the education and organization of the working class, for universal democracy, for mutual interests and goodwill among men, for the prosperity and peace of all, for a free people and a happy world. I just want to add one little snippet to that from 1904 article that just kind of flows into this. Let no one charge that socialists have arrayed class against class in this struggle. That, is, that has been done long since in the evolution of capitalist society. One class now owns the tools while another class uses them. One class is small and rich and the other large and poor. 
One wants more profit and the other more wages. One consists of capitalists and the other of workers. These two classes are at war. Every day of truce is at the expense of labor. There can be no peace and goodwill between these two essentially antagonistic economic classes, nor can this class conflict be covered up or smoothed over. That's my main man, Eugene Debs. So now that we have, we have some content as to what Debs stood for and why, I want to go back chronologically to an article he wrote in 1902 where he addresses, and the, and the article is titled, How I Became a Socialist. He begins going over his history and how he started on, on the American Railway Union. Can I go with the long or the short version? I mean, how much life you got left in you? All right. All right, to do this justice, uh, uh, all right, I better do the short version. The sc uh, uh, so he talked about the, the, his history, how we built up, you know, the, the American Railway Union. And what he was trying to do was to, at, at the time he had no, no clue of the class struggle that, uh, 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 that, that he was trying to, per as he puts it, he was trying to perfect the wage system by d just making it run smoother and, and, and more efficiently. And it all seems very strange to me now, taking a backward, backward look, that my vision was so focalized on a single objective point that I utterly failed to see what now appears as clear as the noonday sun. So clear that I marvel that any working man, however dull, uncomprehending, can resist it. But perhaps it was better, better so. I was to be baptized in socialism in the roar of conflict, and I thank the gods for reserving to this fitful occasion the fiat, quote, let there be light, the light that streams in steady radiance upon the broad way to the socialist republic. The skirmish lines of the American Railway Union were well advanced. A series of small battles was fought and won without the loss of a man. A number of concessions was made by the corporations rather than risk an encounter. Then came the fight on the Great Northern, short, sharp, and decisive. The victory was complete. The only railroad strike of magnitude ever won by an organization in America. Next followed the fi final shock, the Pullman strike. And the American Railway Union again won, clear and complete. The combined corporations were paralyzed and helpless. But at this juncture, there was delivered, from wholly unexpected quarters, a, a swift succession of blows that blinded me for an instant and then opened wide my eyes. And in the gleam of every bayonet and the flash of every rifle, the class struggle was revealed. This was my first practical lesson in socialism, though wholly unaware that it was called by that name. Short of hours.